guys, welcome back to my channel. So today is going to be a little bit of a switch up because John is actually going to be giving two book reviews of a couple of really good adult fantasies that he's read recently. So I am going to hand the video over to him. Hey guys, uh, so this is my first book review. So I'll just start, dive right in. Uh, the first book I'm going to talk about is A Natural History of Dragons by Marie Brennan. It is part of the Memoirs by Lady Trent series. This takes place in a sort of steampunkish land um, because it's it's definitely it's definitely during an industrial time where you know cars were just cars are still a new thing. Um, steamships are still being developed to travel over the oceans to to, to different countries and whatnot. But also in this world, uh, dragons exist. Um, as wild animals and so the story starts off pretty much it's um, about Isabella who later becomes known as Lady Trent. She, she's writing this is written from the perspective of Isabella um, Lady Trent as if it was her own memoir his, her in her own writing as sort of like a autobiography. So it was an interesting it's a different perspective I've never read a book like this in this certain perspective and when it's when I first started reading it and realized what it was um, I was a little nervous that maybe I wasn't gonna be able to finish this or like it but I don't know I, I found myself just entranced as soon as we got to the media parts of the book so anyway so she starts off just kind of like giving you a background story of her as a child in this society women are of high society um, specifically she's from a high society family but Women in particular, while they may assist in scholarly expeditions, um, they def typically don't leave home. They don't leave the comfort and safeties of home. They don't definitely do not travel to foreign lands. Um, they don't mess around with dragons, and especially dragons. The idea if if women want to join the pursuit of knowledge, they typically take not as a rough of field of study as dragons. They typically do like birds or... I don't know, small mammals, um, things of that nature. Um, and, but that just, you know, didn't quite interest her as a kid. Um, you go through a couple of her different stories and her first run in with an actual dragon. And once you get past the childhood phase of her life um, and the influence that you see that her family has on her um, without giving too much away, you do get to read from her perspective her first expedition, her real expedition, going to a foreign land, breaking you know, traditions and customs, culture, and uh, learning the culture of a whole new foreign land um, and learning how to be humble in it, which is a hard lesson for her to learn, but an enjoyable one. It's pretty much just about her first expedition after that, um, all the way up until when she finally arrives home. Uh, I don't want to give too much away. Um, I think it was a fantastic read. I gave it four stars out of five. Uh, I absolutely will continue reading the series. I'm actually currently waiting for the next book to arrive at our house, um, The Tropic of Serpents. Um, I believe there are four altogether. Uh, I'm blanking on what the next two are, but uh, I'm definitely continuing on in this book or in this series. So I will say that uh, this is written from a kind of scientific point of view on dragons, which is actually, as far as I know um, in my readings, I've never come across anything like this. They the dragons are so alien in terms of biology and whatnot, and I, and I feel like in anything you read, like you know, how are they? How do they breathe fire? How do they? If they do breathe fire, or they breathe ice, or um, how do they fly? For the ones who do fly, you know, things of that nature. Um, you know, it's never really touched, talked about, and in this, they talk about that, and it was really fascinating to me, which is why I was interested in the first place, because as you can tell by the cover, you can tell that it's kind of what they're going to go into. So you you are riding along with them in her, along with her and her exhibition crew on this journey of learning about the dragons, and they didn't go too into scientific. Uh, they made enough sense in their own world. Um, I wouldn't say that the same science principles apply in our world to theirs though it's something easily relatable and again not to not they don't go too into the sciences to lose you um, I think it's just enough to satisfy you at least that's how I felt um, you may feel differently um, you may have more questions I mean I still had questions but I felt like they weren't glaring holes as far as the science and how things worked they just you know I felt like they did good explanation of how things 
in their world worked for, as far as the dragons are involved. So that's the natural history of dragons. As my lovely wife has alluded to in another video, I am fascinated. <laughs> I didn't allude to it. I said it straight out. <laughs> so it wasn't necessarily a hint. It was she straight up said it. Whatever. I I'm not a I'm not ashamed to admit. It. I enjoy high fantasy. I enjoy stories with dragons in it. Uh, give me some elves, dwarves, dragons, magic, and I'm I'm bought. I'm I'm in. I enjoy those fantasy worlds. She jokes about how the last Hobbit movie was nothing but battle scenes, and that's actually what I love most about it. Um, it's true, though. <laughs> Pointless. It was the best thing about the entire Pointless. four movies. <laughs> so anyway, so I have another one. Uh, my second book is The Bone Ships. Um, also deals a little bit with dragons. In this, they're called Arachesians. Um, they're based... They're more serpent-like and based on, uh, I believe, eastern dragons. So, meaning they can swim. I don't think they can fly in this, but they can swim. They don't have any legs or anything. They believe they have flippers, if anything. Ooh, give me that look. Yes, they, I think they have flippers. I'm pretty sure they do. Um, which I'm picturing Lapras. Or like Loch Ness. But I'm picturing Lapras. Think Nessie. And I'm picturing Ash swimming around on top of Lapras. Think Nessie, but more vicious. Anyway, so this is also in a different world. Um, this is more like a, a heisty pirate tale, of course, with, you know, serpentine dragons in the waters. Super interesting. Not what I had thought. I was thinking this was going to be more like warships and battleships. Um, and while there was plenty of battles on the seas... Um, it was straight up like just straight up pirates. It was awesome. You know, it's all uh, the ships are made out of the bones and without giving too much away uh, It's just two different kinds of people two different colonies fighting over um, What's left over of the dragon bones um, to make out make for their ships and just the the struggles and the turmoil that's related to it so th it's about these two different countries if you want to call them that and like an island, kind of like the Caribbean islands, Florida Keys, something like that, where there's just a, 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 a ton of different islands. There's not a huge continent or anything. So everybody lives by the sea um, and live off the sea. And these two countries, countries, fight over the Arachesian bones because it is, they are considered the strongest uh, material in this world and therefore are used to make their ships. So you follow the story of Joron Twiner, who is, um, I believe he's like 18 or 19 in this story. He is essentially orphaned and all alone, um, and he has been decided as burn cast, outcast in, in his country. There is a ruling family um, and it is important that, you know, continue strong bloodlines. So it's important that should the mother survive giving birth, uh, their child then has the chance to either become a sacrifice to protect the bone ships in this weird spiritual way, or um, eventually move up into society, you know, become part of the cap and have their chance of continuing up that, you know, societal chain. Um, if your mother dies or you're born with a deformity, you consider burn cast. Um, and then Joran's case he is burn cast due to the loss of his mother at birth he is also additionally orphan later on he loses his father i mean right right, right in the beginning you learn about his past and about how he's lost his father um on the seas and he is captain of the ship in the beginning and I, I don't want to give too too much away but i kind of want to like set the beginning for you so in the beginning he is the captain of this dead ship called tide child and it's considered a black ship where all the misfits um, burn casts who are unable to be part of the high society in this country. They're the ship of the dead. They're, they're considered practically dead at this point. They are shunned by society, um, and but they have a duty to protect the country. So he loses this ship, his ship, to a well-known, they're called shipwives, not captains, to a well-known shipwife, Lucky Meese. Um, and by the way, it's shipwife for males as well. If a male is the captain of the ship, it's still shipwife. Lucky Meese, um, however, sees something in him and takes him along and makes her, uh, makes him his, her deck keeper, which is essentially first mate, second in command. 
Anyway, so it's about the story of those two and their adventures navigating this lost misfit crew of this Black Dead ship and learning how the different countries interact and the stories of the Arakesians and what happened to them and, and, and whatnot. So when I was reading this, it was, it was very good. It's definitely set from the perspective of Draw Twiner, um, even though the most badass character is, is Lucky Meese. Twiner has issues. I mean, he grows, but anyways, it's, it's taken from his perspective. It's not written as if you are him though. Uh, you're just following along behind him. So the writing style was really good. If you don't have a lot of knowledge in sailing, um, this kind of helps you a little bit. Um, th there is a lot of common terms, I, I think. I, I don't know much about sailing, but I you know, heard them on in movies and TV shows. But I feel like there's a lot of common language uh, in this book and, and how they use it and what is used in art and you know, reality. So it was it was an easy read as far as that. Um, there's you know good action scenes, a lot of drama, you know introduction of different creatures because uh, there's not just you know the Arakesians. There's you know there's the Long Thresh and the um, the, Gu the Guilleme. Um Hope I didn't butcher that too much. You know interesting creatures that um, play a large part in in the book and in the story. Um, and you learn a lot, a lot about the crew, and I didn't realize I was into the mood in the mood for like a pirate heist ship or a pirate heist story, but I definitely definitely enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed it so much I gave it four out of five stars. And R.J. Barker, uh, he just came out with the second book called Call to the Bone Ships, um, and I pre-ordered it and just got it, and currently reading it right now, and it's picked up. About I think a year or two later after the end of the first book, um, won't go too much into detail until after I'm done reading that. But yeah, no, it was a great book. Uh, definitely four out of five stars. Uh, would highly recommend it to anybody who's who's into pirates and and uh, maybe a little bit of dragons. But it's mostly a pirate book. If you're into sailing the seven seas, this is for you. All right, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed John's reviews of the Bone Ships and the other dragon book. A Natural History of Dragons. Yeah, that one. If you guys have read these books, please go down into the comments and talk about them with us. We would love to hear your opinions. I know that John really enjoyed reading both of those, so he would probably love to see what other people thought about them as well. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye. <laughs>